Hello and welcome. This is the one that I've had lots of requests of that I know that you're looking forward to. And it really is the Marmite of the bus world. You either love these things or you absolutely hate them. So today, join me on a journey into the history of the Leyland National. The concept of the Leyland National can be traced back to the 1960s. During this period, there was a lot of change in the bus industry. With one person operated large capacity single deck buses becoming very much the vogue. And indeed, this era saw the birth of many rear engined single decker bus, such as the Bristol RE, the AEC Swift and the Leyland Panther. In 1966, one person operated double decker buses were legalised, but they took a little bit of time for this concept to catch on. The trade union's reluctance to participate in one person operated double deckers being an example of this. There was also declining passenger figures as well, and this affected both the rural bus economy as well as the urban bus economy. With all this, and other factors as well, many bus operators were choosing to use single-decker buses rather than double-decker buses. Seeing this swing, Leyland decided to design a brand new single-decker bus. This would be a replacement for the Bristol RE, the Leyland Panther and the AEC Swift, which of course were now all being produced by Leyland subsidiary companies. In the mid-1960s, Leyland started their city bus commuter bus experimental project. The plan was for an ultra-low-floor single-decker bus. Now, where have we seen this sort of concept before? There was a mock-up produced which kind of looked a little bit like a double-ended Bedford VAL. And like the Bedford VAL, this mock-up had small wheels, which, the theory being, would protrude less into the saloon. The mock-up featured a raised rear section of the roof for ventilation equipment. Now that definitely does sound more like a Leyland National that we know and love, doesn't it? In 1968, British Leyland was formed. And the then chairman, Sir Donald Stokes, wanted to rationalise the PSV output immediately. With the new British Leyland company encompassing the likes of Austin, Morris and Jaguar, it was decided to incorporate more car building technology into the construction of the new single decker bus and indeed the commercial vehicle market in general. Leyland had been looking at building buses along a similar line to cars since the 1950s and had had experience of integral construction with the Leyland Olympic. In July 1969, it was announced that the newly formed National Bus Company and British Leyland Motor Company were to set up a joint company. This was going to be called the Leyland National Company. And this company was to have a nice new shiny factory to produce the new buses in. This would be located at Workington in Cumbria. This area being chosen as it was an area of high unemployment. And the factory initially would provide 300 much needed jobs. It was intended that 2,000 single decker buses a year would be produced from the factory with production starting in 1971. The plant required an investment of £8 million and covered 420,000 square feet. Now all this might sound a bit excessive just to build a bus, but when you consider that the National Bus Company was looking at spending £10 million a year on new vehicles, 
you can see why they decided to go for it and keep everything cosy and in-house. Now, one little fact that I've heard that may or may not be true is that the Leyland National Company was actually formed out of the old Crosley Company. So does that mean that Leyland Nationals are actually Crosleys? Hmm. While the factory was being built, work continued on the new bus design. As I mentioned before, it was going to be of integral construction. British Leyland also wanted it to be safe structurally, but wanted it to be comparable in terms of weight and price with conventional vehicles. They also wanted an interior environment for passengers, which would be far in advance of the existing vehicles produced. The cab area had to provide the optimum working conditions for the driver and even cater for lady drivers, which was a big thing in the late 1960s and very early 1970s, as the industry at that time was pretty much male dominated. And lastly, British Leyland wanted a bus that was reliable, but yet had the maximum commonization of its components with other vehicles produced within the group. During 1969, seven prototypes were hand-built at Leyland. And although they were unstyled, you could see the traces of the Leyland National starting to peek through. These prototypes were certainly put through their paces by British Leyland. One was sent to Finland to operate within the Arctic Circle, while another was sent to Spain to see how it operated in warm weather. The one seen in the picture here was subject to extensive paved trialling. Another of the prototypes was used on simulated city bus work, whilst yet another one was used on express simulation work, romping around the Pennines and on motorways. One of the prototype buses was also driven into a 100 tonne concrete block to see how it performed in a front end accident. Another of the prototypes was regularly dismantled and rebuilt to help train the new Workington workforce on the production and how to build the bus. Prototype number two was fully styled to a design by Giovanni Michelotti and this was exhibited at the 1970 commercial motor show held at Earl's Court. Now for those of you who don't know, Giovanni Michelotti was a very renowned designer of sports cars and he worked with such pedigrees as Ferrari, Lancia and Maserati. But you can imagine designing a bus for British Leyland would have been the highlight of his whole career. Originally, the bus was to be available in three lengths, 10 metres, 11 metres and 12 metres, with the door openings of 1.156 metres. However, at a critical point of the design, the International Union of Public Transport recommended that the door widths for public transport vehicles should be a minimum of 1.2 metres. This led to Leyland redesigning the door modules on the bus and it put in an extra 0.3 metres on the design overall. This obviously meant that they dropped the 12 metre version and the 11 metre bus became the 11.3 while the 10 metre bus became the 10.3. The bus was built to a modular design so both door sections and the front and the rear section were identical on the 10.3 and the 11.3. It was only the window modules that were shorter. Mechanically the Leyland National would be powered by the brand new 510 series Leyland engine. This was a six cylinder 8.2 litre turbocharged engine that had been introduced in 1968. This engine featured a fixed cylinder head as Leyland research had indicated that most engine failures came from the cylinder head gasket so by eliminating the cylinder head gasket they had eliminated in theory a big percentage of the failures. There were several gearbox options available for the Leyland National. Leyland 4 or 5 speed epicyclic gearboxes were available and these could be either semi-automatic or automatic. 
There was also an option available for a ZF fully automatic gearbox too. By August 1971, the first Leyland National was being laid down in the new factory at Workington. Now one interesting fact about the Leyland National is the corrosion treatment used on the early buses was actually the same that was used on the hull of the QE2. And this probably explains why those earlier Leyland Nationals are a lot more highly regarded than the later ones. The first Leyland Nationals built at the factory were pre-production models and this was so that the workers could familiarise themselves with the construction of the new bus. There were 10 of these built, 6 of which were demonstrators. However, of the remaining 4, 2 were destined for London Country, 1 was for Cumberland and 1 was for Northern General. These first nationals were all 11.3 dual door buses. Now it might be worth just having a look at the Leyland National type codes and explaining those. The first models were initially 10 for 10.3 or 11 for 11.3. 51 stood for the 510 engine. Then there was a 1 for a 1 door bus or 2 for a 2 door bus. Finally, this was followed by an R for a right-hand drive bus or an L for a left-hand drive bus. So the code for the 11.3 two-door bus pictured here would have been 1151-2R. Simple, isn't it? The first Leyland National to enter service with a National Bus Company subsidiary was pre-production bus number 5, which was handed over on the 13th of March 1972 to Cumberland Motor Services, which was the closest bus operator to the Workington plant. Regular construction of the Leyland National started off with buses for Selneck and also for Crosville. The first municipal order was for Plymouth. During the latter part of 1972, production started to get into full swing of the Leyland National. NBC subsidiaries such as Midland General, London Country, Bristol, Yorkshire, Woolen, Gosport and Fareham, Alder Valley and of course East Kent all received 11.3 metre Leyland Nationals. Around this time the first 10.3 Leyland Nationals were built and these went to Southern Vectors here on the sunny Isle of Wight. The Leyland National was performing quite well in service, but there was some feedback about some various issues that were being experienced. The most serious of these was the imbalance of the braking caused by the excess weight of the power pack and the gearbox on the rear axle. During 1974, Northern General rebuilt a Leyland National that had been damaged in an accident. The batteries were moved from the rear of the bus to the front underneath the driver's cab. They replaced the large single fuel tank with two slightly smaller ones and moved them forward a bay as well. The pod on the roof containing the heating and ventilation system was also made a lot smaller. And finally Northern General removed the rear bumper and fitted some fibreglass panels around the rear end. The information gathered by Northern General during this experiment was passed on to Leyland National and this had some bearing on the Phase 2 model when this was introduced in 1976. This updated version of the Leyland National also featured more engine soundproofing, and when the manufacturer moved the batteries to the front, the room for this soundproofing was created. There were a few other modifications to the Phase 2 Nationals as well. There were modifications to the brakes and the interior of the bus as well with the chrome handrails being replaced by black powder coated handrails to help with the problem that has been experienced with reflections on the windscreen at night. This also saw some of the decency screens extended and the draft screen by the door extended out to prevent more reflections as well. In fact the rear decency screens were modified so they became a structural part of the bodywork. The Phase 2 Leyland National became the most numerous of the type, with every national bus company taking examples, 
except for Oxford, who actually managed to get away with operating no Leyland Nationals at all during this period. PTEs such as Greater Manchester and West Midlands took the Phase 2 National in large numbers. Whilst London Transport built up a huge fleet of Phase 2 Leyland Nationals as well. The next development of the Leyland National was in 1978 when a low cost version of the bus was announced. This was to become the B series Leyland National and was aimed for the rural bus economy where the cost of a brand new all singing all dancing bus probably couldn't be justified. It was available in just one length, 10.3 metres long, and had a conventional heating system, which meant it had no pod on the roof. The interior was lit by standard fluorescent tubes rather than the large, brightly lit, diffused lighting on the normal Leyland Nationals. All the chrome work, not that there was a lot on Leyland Nationals, was replaced by black painted metal, and the engine was downrated. This cheaper option found favour with operators like Crossfield, Ribble and London Country. By the late 70s there was a lot of operating experience with the Leyland National and the general bone of content seemed to be with the 510 fixed head turbocharged engine. This prompted Leyland to redesign the National and offer the TL11 engine as an option. Now what looks to be a standard B-series Leyland National parked in between these other two Nationals is in fact the prototype Mark II Leyland National. In the spring of 1979 the production Leyland National 2 which is the one on the left you see there was unveiled at Helsinki. As the TL11 wasn't yet available in horizontal form, they had inserted the 0680 engine, rated at 170 brake horsepower, fitted with the 5 speed close ratio semi automatic gearbox. Unlike the prototype Leyland National 2, the front end was completely redesigned. The 0680 engine, being a bit of a bigger beast, needing more room, so the cooling pack, the radiator, and the fan was moved to the front. Now, not only did this help with weight distribution, but it also assisted the cooling because you have the ram effect of the air being pushed into the front of the bus rather than it being sucked in round the back. This increased the length of the Leyland Nationals from 10.3 to 10.6 and from 11.3 to 11.6. Another modification to the Mark II Leyland National was the adoption of the Leyland Titan cab. There were other changes as well, including the uprating of the axles to accept more weight. Leyland had always been reluctant to offer the Gardner 6LHB in the Leyland National. And now with this redesign where the 0680 would fit, the 6LHB would also fit. But Leyland dragged its heels over this and it wasn't until the early 1980s that this option became available on the Leyland National 2. For a bus that was deemed to be a standard vehicle, there was certainly a lot of variations. In 1973, the Suburban Express version of the Leyland National was announced. This would be fitted with semi-coach seats and overhead luggage racks. And whilst the prototype, featured here, had a flat floor all the way through, the normal Suburban Expresses featured the normal conventional floor with the step up towards the rear axle. The next spin-off of the Leyland National was the Super National. Now these were very high spec, low seating capacity vehicles and of a very similar layout to the VIP executive coaches that you see today. They featured such things as toilets, a galley kitchen and office equipment. The problem was, despite all this luxury and refinement on the interior, on the outside they still looked like a Leyland National bus and the idea never really caught on. A rather more startling rebuild of a Leyland National was this one for British Airways, which was known as a people scoop. It effectively turned the Leyland National into a half cab bus, but showed how the Leyland National was so adaptable. 
This bus, which was converted by Wadham Stringer, was later rebuilt to a conventional layout, but as with all the British Airways Leyland Nationals, which they built up a large fleet of, they were three-doored buses. Another slightly over-optimistic plan for the Leyland National saw the launch of the Leyland Lifeliner Casualty Unit. This was basically a Leyland National that had been turned into a giant ambulance and was fitted with, of all things, a detachable hovercraft. It also had adjustable suspension so it could be raised to access unstable and slightly rocky ground. The idea never really caught on and the bus was later rebuilt as a bus for Midland Red. Another rather forward thinking idea was an electric bus. However, with the batteries located in a trailer behind the bus, it was over the maximum length limit of the time and couldn't be used in service on the public road and therefore was only used on the Runcorn busway. In 1974, yet another version of the Leyland National was revealed and this was a very useful spin-off for overseas sales. This was the C-27 project, which was Leyland National running units added to a standard bus body. On this occasion, it was built by Eastern Coachworks. So yes, you are looking at an Eastern Coachworks bodied Leyland National. The plan was that the running units could be exported and the bodywork built by local assembly companies in the country of choice. This project later morphed into the B21 project, which was a separate chassis with the Leyland National running units. And while we're talking about weird and wonderful Leyland Nationals, it's worth a mention of these. Now, these actually aren't Leyland Nationals. These are Leyland Dab articulated buses, but they were fitted with bodies in the style of Leyland Nationals. And this often causes a lot of confusion amongst enthusiasts. Another thing that's often overlooked in the story of the Leyland National are the sales of the export buses. Buses were exported to Australia, France, Venezuela and Jamaica, and Holland as well, where many received this attractive front-end treatment to help cure the reflection issue on the screen at night. One was even sent off to Russia, which is probably why they don't like us that much, while the Australian market was offered an intermediate length of 10.9 metres long, and this was the front half of an 11.3 Leyland National, coupled to the rear part of a 10.3 Leyland National. This was only offered on the Australian market, although the prototype did see service with Rennies of Dunfermline. Now I must admit that we're just literally dipping our toe in the water with all the weird and wonderful nationals there were out there, and it might be worth at some point doing a full video on various Leyland National variations. If that's something you would like to see, please leave a comment below. If you do want that video, we can go into depth on more things like the Gardner engine conversions that were done by various bus companies and the ones that were fitted with Volvo engines and DAF engines. And I believe there was one also fitted with an 0600 or an 0680 engine somewhere along the line. All these were done by various bus companies to try and improve the reliability of the National during its service life. Leyland Nationals also lent themselves quite well to conversion into mobility buses and this was a time when the mobility bus idea was just really starting to take off. Again this is something we can go into detail more in a later video if you want that later video that is. I interrupt your viewing pleasure to bring you yet another advert and again it's a bit of self-promotion. For many years I've been helping to organise the Thanet Vintage Bus Road Run. The run was started in 2008 by a lovely guy called Mick Martin and was initially a recreation of the old open top route around the coast of Thanet. This year, which is 2024 for those of you watching in real time, I've decided to go for a different format. We will be operating a small network of routes using vintage and lots of vintage buses and coaches. The hub for the network will be the Spitfire and Hurricane Memorial Museum at Manston near Ramsgate in Kent. And we'll have routes serving Ramsgate, Broadstairs, Margate, Westgate, Ramsgate, Minster, Cliffsend 
and a feeder bus to and from Sandwich as well. There's no need to book and riding the buses is for free. But we do have a voluntary collection for a local animal charity, Cats in Crisis Thanet. In 2023, we raised £800 for them from generous donations of the passengers on the buses. More information and timetables will be loaded onto our Facebook page. Just search Thanet Vintage Bus Road Running Day. See you on Sunday the 14th of July. Now back to the main feature. If the vehicles mentioned in the previous section didn't stretch the concept of the Leyland National too far, this section probably will. And again, this really does need to be the subject of its own video. In 1978, the LEV, Leyland Experimental Vehicle, emerged. This was basically a Leyland National with a cab at each end mounted on a four-wheel railway underframe. Following extensive testing in America and England, a second prototype was built. But by this time, Leyland National 2 had gone into production, so this one received the front end of a Leyland National 2. This unit was also extensively tested before being sold to Northern Ireland Railways. All this testing and these prototypes led to the Class 142 car diesel multiple units. Now obviously the cab has been changed but the side you can see is still pure Leyland National complete with the centrally fitted roof pod. These later morphed into the class 141 and the 142 rail buses. Now although the Leyland National structure is particularly strong the front end didn't actually meet the British Rail standard for crashworthiness, so this is why they had the revised front put on them. The last class 142 was withdrawn in 2020, and since then many have found their way onto preserved railways. Right, let's get back to the main event. There's no doubt that the Leyland National 2 was a superb bus, but unfortunately it appears to have been born at the wrong time. In the early 1980s, National Bus Company launched their market analysis project, and this identified the need for more double-deckers and less single-deckers. The result being that the bottom fell out of the market for single-decker buses literally overnight. And in 1983, the National Bus Company ordered just 52 Leyland Nationals. Production staggered on until 1985, with the last buses being for Southdown and Halton. The last bus was C49 OCM. By this time, there had been 1,189 Leyland National 2s built. In all, 7,730 Leyland Nationals were built, which was well short of the envisaged 2,000 a year when the bus was launched back in the early 1970s. Although Leyland National production finished, the mark was certainly not over and done with. In the mid-1980s, the National Bus Company and a lot of other operators as well went for minibuses in a big way and this created a surplus of Leyland Nationals around the time for deregulation. Leyland Nationals became a very valuable commodity during this time and many were mixed and matched and swapped between operators and various other companies. A lot of the smaller independent companies in those early days based their services around operating Leyland Nationals. And a lot of these companies, such as Chase, Yorkshire Terrier and Birmingham Coach Company, became synonymous with the Leyland National. The good, strong, solid body structure of the Leyland National lent itself to being re-engined. And as I mentioned before, there were Volvo engines, there were DAF engines, there were all sorts of engines shoehorned into these buses. In addition to the independents, the main fleet, such as Arriva, First Bus and Stagecoach, operated vast fleets of Leyland Nationals. And it really was a bus that you could see in all four corners of the country. From Falmouth to Falkirk, 
From Dover to Dundee, these things were absolutely everywhere. A lot of operators such as Trent actually facelifted the rather spartan interior on the Leyland Nationals to make them more passenger friendly and more modern. Something altogether different though was the Leyland National Greenway. This idea was conceived by London and Country who were still running vast amounts of Leyland Nationals. They went into collaboration with East Lancashire, the coach builder in Blackburn. And from 1991, the first Greenway Nationals started to appear. The bodywork was stripped down to a shell. It was refurbished, repanelled, reglazed, and the inside was all retrimmed with all modern interior and all modern laminates. There were many types of the National which were used as the basis of the Greenway conversion. 10.3, 11.3 metre buses, as well as Mark 1 and Mark 2 buses. They all were re-engined with the Gardner 6H LXB engine. And I can say from personal experience, they may look a little bit strange if you're used to looking at normal Nationals, but they are lovely buses to drive, almost like a rather boxy looking Bristol RE. Despite all the rebuilding and the re-engineering, the majority of Leyland Nationals ended up in the scrapyard. But they are still quite solid vehicles and I have no doubt that there are many lurking around in yards somewhere. In fact, I know for a fact there are a bunch of Leyland Nationals that are actually used as perimeter fencing in Scotland. Happily though, the Leyland National survives in preservation in a fairly good quantity. The owners of these buses are supported by the Leyland National Group who can provide all sorts of technical information, history and source of spare parts for anybody who owns a Leyland National. Another name that is synonymous with the Leyland National is Mike Nash, the dealer from Weybridge in Surrey. He is always another good person to speak to regarding bits and pieces for Leyland Nationals. It's fair to say that if you go to a bus rally around the country at some point you will encounter a Leyland National and they always prove to be very popular buses. I hope you have enjoyed this 11.3 metre long episode of Bus Histories. As with any bus, especially one with a history like the Leyland National, it is hard to fit in all operators, all types and all modifications. And if I have left anybody out or anybody's favourite fleet out, I do apologise. If you enjoyed this episode though, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel as this will help the channel grow and you will get notifications when I make further releases in this series. Don't forget to comment and say what you liked about this video or what you didn't like about this video and if there's anything that I missed out. Also, what bus would you like me to cover in the future? And don't say the Leyland GNU because that's just not really going to happen. Thanks very much. Goodbye for now.